Hello everyone, I'm Rose Savage and welcome back to my channel. For those of you who don't know me, I am a musician and I also host the series called Moments in Music where I discuss significant historical events that have happened throughout the history of music and the musicians that are involved. And today I'm doing another lawsuit video. Last week's video was about the lawsuits that Dua Lipa is currently facing. So if you haven't seen that video, go check it out. But this episode is going to be about John Fogarty, who was the front man for the band Creedence Clearwater Revival. And this lawsuit is borderline hysterical to me. Also, if you haven't noticed, I have finally dyed my hair. It was supposed to be purple, but I used the Strawberry Leopard Prismatic Purple, which is kind of like an indigo color so if it looks a little funky don't come for me in the comments i'm planning to go back over it one more time so it's a more solid color but anyways that's irrelevant don fogarty was born on may 28th 1945 three days after me fellow gemini in berkeley california he is the third child of five brothers and attended a catholic school called the school of the madeline the school was very strict and fogarty claimed that it was common for them to not allow students to use the bathroom even when they asked and he recalled wetting himself often and having to sit in his wet clothes that sounds like a terrible school he went on to attend saint mary's high school then eventually transferred to El Cerrito High in El Cerrito, California. This is where he would meet the other members of the band that would eventually end up being known as Creedence Clearwater Revival. His older brother, Tom Fogarty, actually knew these guys beforehand and would jam with them on guitar before the band became the band. In the same time frame, John Fogarty formed a cover band under the name The Blue Velvets with bassist Stu Cook and drummer Doug Clifford. Later on, John Fogarty's older brother joined the group and in 1964, they ended up signing with Fantasy Records, which the record company took it upon themselves to change the band's name from the Blue Velvets to the Gollywogs, which why? <laughs> I'm sorry, but the Blue Velvets sound way cooler than the Gollywogs, but we'll continue. They recorded some songs at the time that didn't really make it anywhere under that name. And in 1966, John Fogarty ended up getting drafted to serve in the Vietnam War. And after serving for a couple of years, he was eventually discharged in 1968. After John Fogarty got out of the military, the Gollywogs started back up again and eventually changed their name to what we know as Creedence Clearwater Revival. The band began in 1968 and they started releasing hits and albums left and right. And interestingly enough, many people don't realize that CCR was only together as a band for three years. There was a lot of infighting going on between the band members, mainly John Fogarty versus everyone else. He was predominantly the songwriter in the band as well as the lead singer and lead guitarist, which apparently gave him the opinion that his contribution mattered more than the rest of the band. So all of this inner turmoil caused Tom Fogarty, John's older brother, to leave CCR in 1971. Aside from all the infighting going on, he felt like he was being taken for granted, thus leaving the band altogether. And with this, John Fogarty decided to share songwriting and vocal production credits with Stu Cook and Doug Clifford, who were the remaining members of the band, on their last album, Mardi Gras. This album was released in 1970 and the album received subpar reviews, but either way, this ended up being the band's last album due to them breaking up in 1972. So at the end of CCR's career, John Fogarty was working on a solo album, which consisted of mostly country and old Western covers. He was the sole producer, composer, and instrumentalist on the entire album, which is pretty cool. He also created his first official album, which was self-titled John Fogarty in 1975, and another album called Hoodoo also in 1975. Apparently, John Fogarty wasn't too pleased with how the records turned out, and he had asked his record company, Asylum Records, at the time to destroy the albums completely, which led him to taking a hiatus from music until 1985. So fast forwarding to 1985, Fogarty released another solo album titled Centerfield through Warner Brothers Records. And this is where the lawsuit comes into play. And one of the songs on the album was called The Old Man Down the Road, and it actually ended up being one of the top 10 on the singles chart at that time. However, when CCR's old record company, Fantasy Records, got word of this album, they felt otherwise. Specifically, Saul Zantz, the owner of Fantasy Records. He was heated about the album for a number of reasons. So the first reason being that Saul believed that the song off of John Fogarty's album, The Old Man Down the Road, sounded just like CCR's song, Run Through the Jungle, with different words. Secondly, 
Fogarty and Zantz were absolutely not on good terms, and the album John Fogarty put out had two songs on there called Mr. Greed and Zanz Can't Dance, which the first song is self-explanatory, considering that John Fogarty felt as if Saul Zantz kind of bled CCR dry of the money that they should have made when they were a band under his label. The second song, however, sounded like a stab at Saul. Zanz Can't Dance was a song that John Fogarty wrote about a street dancer who had a pig for a sidekick that would pickpocket onlookers while the street dancer performed. And in the song, the pig's name is Zanz, which is pretty obvious that he was referring to Saul Zanz. I mean, Zanz, Zanz. You get the picture. So not only did Saul Zantz take a plagiarism lawsuit out against Fogarty, but also a defamation of character lawsuit as well. He felt as if the song Zantz Can't Dance painted him as a thief and a murderer, which I don't know about the murderer part, but we all know what record companies tend to do to artists. So John Fogarty probably had a very good reason to feel the way that he did in terms of referring to Saul Zantz as a thief. But even in 1985, you could still sue somebody for a defamation of character and there are thousands of songs that people have written as comeback songs, but more times than not, artists that have written comeback songs don't necessarily put the person that they're referring to's name in the song. So perhaps John Fogarty had the right to write a song like that, but he kind of put himself in a hole by saying that the pig's name in the song was Zanz. Regardless, the pair went to federal court in San Francisco in 1988 against each other, for the plagiarism lawsuit. Saul Zantz and Fantasy Records as the plaintiff and John Fogarty and Warner Brothers Records as the defendants. The trial took two weeks and the coolest thing happened. John Fogarty took to the witness stand with his guitar and played both compositions for the court. What he told so true They told me don't go walking slow The devil's on the loose Better on to the jungle Better run to the jungle Better run to the jungle Why don't look back to see He take a thunder from the mountain He take a lightning from the sky He bring a strong man to his begging me He make the young girl mama cry You better hide it high you got to jump up and run away. You got to hide it, hide it, hide. I mean, really, how many musicians can actually say that they got taken to court for their music and played guitar in front of the judge and jury as an example to defend their case. Super rock and roll. John Fogarty explained that even though both songs sound similar, they were both variations of his signature style, which he called swamp rock. In other words, they are inevitably going to sound the same because they are both him. Duh. So with this, the jury was convinced that Fogarty made an extremely valid point and it only took them two hours to deliberate the verdict and ultimately John Fogarty won the case. Now the defamation of character case against him wasn't as easy to convince, which ended up with Fogarty settling with Fantasy Records out of court for an undisclosed amount. After the plagiarism case, Fogarty tried to counter sue Fantasy Records and Saul Zantz for the more than $1 million he had to pay in legal fees. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, nothing came of it. And John Fogarty never got that money back. I think this is a good learning moment for all musicians to be very careful with record companies. Now, do I think that all record companies are crooks? Not necessarily. Sometimes it can be extremely helpful to be signed onto a record label to get your music out there and receive proper revenue for it. But there have been numerous, numerous examples of record companies, such as this specific case, that have raked in more money than the artist did. And that's just not fair. John Fogarty Fogarty also stated that Fantasy Records made 99.9% of their entire revenue from Creedence Clearwater Revival alone and recalled never getting the compensation that they deserved as a band. In that aspect, that doesn't sound like a record company that I would like to be signed on to. But in today's day and age, we know much more about the legalities of record labels now than artists did back in 1968. So I would like to know your thoughts. Was Saul Zantz and Fantasy Records well within their right to sue John Fogarty for plagiarism? Or is it absolutely
absolutely ridiculous that this lawsuit happened in the first place. Should a record label be able to sue a former artist for sounding the way that they did when they were signed on to that label? Did John Fogarty get the compensation that he deserved or was he cheated out of what he was worth? Comment below and let me know what you think about this entire case. But that's all I've got for you all today. Don't forget to hit the like button if you really like this video. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the little notification bell beside it. That way you can stay updated with all of my future videos and music releases. It's been a little over a month now, but I released a song called Cry About It. You can check it out right here on YouTube. The link in the description box below will take you to my Spotify where you can headbang to it. But anyways, that's all I've got for you all today. Thank you so much for checking this video out and I will see you in the next one. Bye.